I knew if I spent a dollar outside of that, that would go towards a vacation or something else, that's one less dollar I have to buy another property and that's less time or it's gonna take me longer to quit my job. So I sacrificed everything, got to where I was. Now I will never have a job again. This is the Building a Lifestyle Business Podcast, where we inspire solopreneurs like you to win back your life by teaching you how to build businesses that maximize your freedom, flexibility, and income, all without trading time for money. Here's your host, Nick Murphy. Hey there, my friend, and welcome to the Building a Lifestyle Business Podcast. My name is Nick Murphy. I'm your host. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. If you're a frequent listener, listen, you know I love you. Thanks for checking out yet another episode of the podcast. And if you're a new listener, I'm really happy that you are here. I'm thrilled that you found us. I'm going to do everything I can in the next half hour or so to make sure that you get a ton of value. The mission that we have here is to inspire you through stories like the one you're about to hear through creative ways. I mean, everyone does things differently, but if you're feeling stuck in your career, if you want to go do something else, if you want to win back your life and really create that freedom to live how you want on your terms, uh, lifestyle business is a great way to do that. And there are a lot of different types of lifestyle businesses and ways to go about creating that lifestyle for yourself. So this episode you're about to hear is just another example of someone who's gone out and been able to achieve that for themselves. And we dig into the details of how they did it in their specific business. And to that point, today's guest is Dustin Heiner. And in our conversation, Dustin and I discuss how he's used real estate to walk away from his government job, how he built a rental property business from the ground up. And he shares some great advice for any new or aspiring lifestyle business owners that are looking to use real estate to build income and wealth for themselves. There's a lot here. It gets really heavy on the real estate talk, but hang in there, stick with us. There's a lot of really, really good nuggets for any type of business that you're looking to build for yourself. I won't make you wait any longer, so sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Dustin Heiner. My guest today is Dustin Heiner. Dustin is an author, podcaster, and blogger over at masterpassiveincome.com, where he helps people quit their jobs by investing in real estate. Dustin, a Phoenix man like myself, good to have you here. How are you? I'm great, Nick. How about yourself? I am doing awesome. I appreciate you taking time. You've got a really fascinating story. And kind of before we get into it, you weren't always self-employed fully in the real estate capacity doing rental properties. So just for the audience, walk us through kind of what you did after school and what your your quote unquote day job was and kind of when you started dabbling in real estate. It really started the idea of never working a job again and basically being my own boss and being financially independent. It started when I was like 13 or 12 or something like that when I had my own paper route where I delivered newspapers door to door. And I realized, man, the more people I sell these papers to, the more money I make. And it's great not having a boss. Anyways, fast forward, I, my first job was at Walmart. I started working there and I realized how much money they take out, the government takes out of my paycheck. And I, that solidified it. Like, oh, I'm working for myself. This is ridiculous. <laughs> so I went to college, you know, like, like they, everybody tells you to do. And then I got a job and the job was good. I had a really good job. I worked at the county government. I worked at the sheriff's department in the IT area of the sheriff's department in the county that I, that I lived. And as I was working there, I realized that this is just not for me. Like it re-solidified everything in my brain that I needed to do something to get out of working a job so I can travel the world, that I can be with my family, that I could do really whatever I want. And so I, I have started many businesses, like the, the paper route. I had a graphic and website design company. I had a, skateboard manufacturing business. I even started a convenience store and a pizzeria. I, I've done so many different businesses. And the easiest one, and the one that was the way that got me over the top to where I can quit my job was investing in rental properties, like specifically rental properties, not flipping, not wholesaling or tax deeds or liens or anything like that, just rental properties. So if I buy one rental property, I realize that I can make money from the tenants and they cover the expenses, they cover the mortgage, they cover everything. And I make money every single month and I don't do any work because I have property managers doing that work. And so it was a side hustle from the very beginning when I, when I started my uh, working for my job. After about two or three years, I realized I got to change something. So I bought one property. After I bought that one property, realizing I'm getting $350 in passive income every single month from that one property, I thought, man, if that's just one property, imagine if I had 10, that's $3,500 a month coming in. If I had 20, that'd be 7,000. I could quit my job then. And so I just worked as hard as I could to save money, to buy more properties, to make more money, to buy more properties. And it just was a, uh, I just kept trying because I knew the end goal 
And it took me about nine years before I eventually quit my job. And now it's been three years since I've quit. And now I am just super ecstatic. I was 37 years old when I quit my job and I will never get a job again. That's awesome. Good for you. Let's talk a little bit about the businesses that you had, because like so many other entrepreneurs, you didn't just start with what you're doing today. You started with other things. Just walk us down that journey is a lot of things, but was there something specific that stuck out in terms of what was missing? You were, you know, you didn't have a job or you did have a job still, but you were, you were working for yourself, but it wasn't, was it not fully passive enough like rental properties are or kind of what was missing in those other ventures? And what'd you, more, most importantly, I guess, uh, for the audience, what'd you learn from those experiences that has enabled you to be successful now in real estate? So there's two things. One is what I learned that I was missing, which was passive income, which I'll get to in a second. But the other thing that it did have that I did not want was overhead, was employees, was having to babysit people and have to have lots of money coming out of my pocket to pay for people to do work. I thought that was the right way to go, create a business that I had a lot of employees running, running around doing work for me. But I realized that all that overhead, all that money going out to employees, if they don't work, then I don't make money. Just like if I had a job, if I don't work in my job, I don't make money. And so that's what it did have that I did not want to have. So every business that I create now is only about passive income, how I can make money without working and without having other people work too. Or, you know, I, I hire people like property managers, but I try to make sure there's passive income. So one thing that I knew that it lacked, all these businesses lacked was the passive nature of making money. See, there's earned income where you work an hour, you make that, you earn that money, but there's passive where you work one time and you make money over and over again. And I, it takes me about three hours. Once I have the business set up in a certain area of the country. So I lived in California when I first started investing, moved to Phoenix uh, about 10 years later. And so I, I currently live in Phoenix, but when I first started investing, prices in California were ridiculously high. And so I started investing in Ohio and Texas and other states because it was so expensive. Now what I do with passive income is I have other people like property managers, realtors, wholesalers, inspectors, all those other people to do work for me so I don't have to work and I can do whatever I want with my time. Let's talk about real estate since you're an expert. It seems, I mean, it is, it's very market driven. I was in Phoenix in 2006, 2007, when people were just completely getting past the inspection period. They were buying properties sight unseen for this fear of missing out. Uh, we all know what happened when the real estate bubble popped. And I think, you know, the Phoenix market got hit as hard as, as any. How do you actually go about, or, or what was the learning curve like to figure out what made a good purchase decision in terms of, of a rental property? Did you, did you lose your ass once or twice figuring it out? Did you always make good decisions? And kind of how did, how did you learn that? I always wanted to make passive income. And that was, I didn't know the business when I first started. I had nobody coaching me. I just basically learned through the School of Hard Knocks. Since then, I've developed a system that helps me to build businesses everywhere I want to invest or around the entire country. But what I did learn was that as I made the business um, as passive income driven as possible. So monthly income coming in, that was my sole goal because I knew appreciation, basically appreciation of a house goes up and down. You know, if the market goes down, then you don't have appreciation, you have depreciation. You can't count on that. Now, what I did realize what I could count on was somebody needing a place to live. And with them having it or needing a place to live, they actually are able to rent a property from me and put money in my pocket, as well as pay for my mortgage, the taxes, all the expenses and all that sort of stuff. And so when I started investing in 2007, so before the crash, like I bought my, my first property in 2006 and 2007. And even though the prices of those properties went down in value, I was still making money. I did not lose my shirt on any one of my properties. In fact, I still own those properties. They're doing really, really well for me. Now I've owned them for what, 12 years now, and they've, they've since been paid off. And so I make even more money, more money now. But what it really comes down to is the monthly cash flow. And this is what I tell all my students, all my coaching students, everybody that listens to me. I say, if you're going to buy a rental property, do your best to shoot for $250 or more a month in passive income from that one property. And if you do that, you're going to do really, really well when there's any um, market shifts or you know crashes or anything like that. Because if a fluctuation of rent goes down by like $50 or $100, which it re rarely ever does, you're still in the black. You're still making $150 a month. And so it's the passive income that I shot for. And I didn't know that was the right way to do it. I just knew I needed income to quit my job. And it turns out that was the best way to invest. 
When you are coaching people that are interested in getting into real estate investing, do you have a specific type of strategy in terms of how they're financing those properties? Do you encourage cash buyers? Are, are there ways to finance? Let's just dig into the nuts and bolts of, of the listener out there who's like, I've always, I've always kind of wanted to do this. You know, I don't know if I have enough money. Uh, what are the main couple things to consider? And then kind of how do, you, how do you think people should get started, particularly if they can't just be a cash buyer? That, that's actually where everybody starts. Everybody starts with, well, I don't have enough money. Like I wasn't born with a lot of money. And I personally wasn't born with a lot of money at all. And so I had to start from scratch buying one property after another. And so everybody starts from zero and they start from the beginning. Now, this is what I tell everybody that this is a slow growth business. This is not a get rich quit scheme at all. This is a get wealthy plan. And so if you start with buying one property, if you have cash, if you get a mortgage, if you find a seller financing, if you do a tax lien or tax deed, whatever it might be, which I'll get to in a second, it, however you get that first property, if it starts making you money, then you save that money to buy another property. Then, then when you buy the next property, you save that money to buy another property. And so all of the students that I go through and actually anybody that I teach in how to invest in real estate, I apply where they are because there's not one size fits all um, strategy and people have different goals. They have they have different starting points. Some people have loads of debt that we got to work through that I help them to get out of. And some people have equity inside their home that we can tap into. Some people have cash, but sometimes I even have to turn down coaching students because I tell them that as they're t explaining everything about their situation, their life, their debt, their income, all that sort of stuff, I find out that they're not ready to invest right now. But what I do give them is I give them a game plan. And more often than not, I say to them, if you implement these five things into your life right now, a year from now, you will be ready for coaching. Like give you a quick example. If somebody has a lot of debt, we need to work on that debt. If somebody doesn't have enough income, working on that income. If they have too many expenses, sell a car and go for something else that's smaller that or has less money coming out of your pocket. All that sort of stuff, I in my coaching, I look at where they are and help them to get to their goals the fastest. But when it comes down to you know, where should I start? It really comes down to who you are, what your life is like, you know, if you have good credit, if you have bad credit, if you have cash. Now, the easiest way to buy properties is with cash. Obviously, anybody could buy with cash. The harder thing is if you want it with no or low money down, which I also show my students. And here's a quick one. Most people may not have heard, but there's an, a loan out there that is open for everybody. As long as you live in a house, you can buy a property with 3.5% down. So if it's a $100,000 house that you're going to buy, it's $3,500 down. Well, that's not a whole ton. It's a lot of money, but people can work it up and save it up. So, well, if you bought a property that's an FHA home with 3.5% down and you bought a duplex, you lived in one side of it and then rented out the other side, well, you already have a built-in property that's making you money. And then within a year or two, you do it all over again, refinance and do it all over again. So there's strategies like that that are just terrific. So if you have very little money, we can work through that as well. Awesome stuff. I can geek out on real estate stuff with you all day. But in, in the interest of my audience who might not be interested in real estate, I want to just pull back the onion a little bit and talk about the, tar the parts of your business that were the most challenging. It sounds like you got off on the right foot. You did the slow burn. So you didn't go crazy. But what was the most difficult part of your business uh, in the real estate capacity thus far? And kind of what did you do to overcome that? The most difficult thing is doing the business right. The easiest thing to do is to buy a house. Anybody can buy a house. You basically find a seller from a realtor. You put your money down, you get a financing and the title company does the rest of the work. It's super simple to buy a property. It's hard to set up a business that runs itself. I'll give you an example. When I first started, I had no clue what I was doing, but I knew I was buying in Ohio from California, you know, thousands of miles away. And so I knew I needed somebody to manage the property. Well, I've heard of property managers, so I went and found the first one I, I you know, looked up on the online and talked to that person. It sounded fine. Well, it turns out that person started stealing from me about six months into managing my properties. And they were stealing me from me for quite a while. And I had no clue because I didn't know what I was doing. But in setting up the business now, there are certain steps that you got to take in order to find the right property managers, inspectors, realtors, basically the team. The hardest part is building your business and a team. So here's basically, I'll give you an analogy of what it's like. Imagine you have a convenience store 
if you're going to start a convenience store from scratch, you got to get bank accounts. You have to make sure that you have all the infrastructure. You have to have your technology, your point of sale system, your coolers. Your, you have to basically build the business around it. Stuff to sell. <laughs> Lots of inventory. Yeah. That's the last thing is the inventory because you need a place for people to go into. But then let's say your candy bar, you buy one candy bar, you put it in your big store to sell. Well, that's one candy bar that you sell. Same thing with a rental property. I look at all my properties as inventory. I built my business around it so that each property that I have is another piece of inventory that I put in my business. So the business runs no matter if I have 100 properties or two because I have the business set up around it. Does that make sense? Yeah, complete sense. And unlike the candy bar that gets stale if it's not purchased and you have to throw it away, your uh, your assets actually create big amounts of cash uh, at the end once they're paid off, even after the passive income might go away. Absolutely. Well, in, in the end, what it comes down to is you make money on real estate in six different ways. And I'll quickly go through them. One is passive income, you know, making money every single month, expenses underneath the um, income. So you make money every single month. You also have um, regular appreciation, just market appreciation. You also have forced appreciation where you fix up a house and the value is worth more. You also have equity buy down where this is one thing I absolutely love. If I buy a house with a mortgage, I am not paying that mortgage or interest. My tenants are paying that mortgage and interest for me. It's absolutely fantastic. You also have tax advantages like 1031 exchange. It's a business. So you have business write-offs. And so you also have more appreciation it just in general as you buy the property. If you buy it lower than the total dollar amount, that is the net value of it. So let me give you a quick example. If the value of the home is $100,000, but you buy it for eighty. dollars you pocket $20,000 in equity right then and there. There's so there's six ways that you make money with real estate, which makes me so excited because I make money left and right with rental properties. I can hear the excitement. I love it. So you've done a lot of different things. You were able to walk away from your job in government. What has been the highest high? Like, What is the thing that just you have that moment and you, and you wake up one day or you look in the mirror and you're like, this is what I've done all this for. Describe that highest high so far in your business. It was probably on two different occasions. One in 2017, right after I quit my job, I took my family for a six week trip around Japan. We literally drove 1200 miles around the island of Japan on a six week vacation. It was probably right around where we were in, um, probably Mount Fuji or on the way down to Hiroshima that it just realized like, man, we are traveling for six weeks and seeing this amazing thing. So that's the first time. But the next year in 2018, this last year, in uh, March of last year, I took my family on a six-week trip through 11 different countries in Europe. And it was probably you know like looking at the Eiffel Tower and being like, wow, this is my life. This is fantastic. And we're, I have four kids. So my wife and four kids were traveling all through everywhere in Europe, you know, 11 different countries, like I said, but looking at the Australian Alps was just so amazing to me. And I'm just, just in awe that everything that I sacrificed, like I, I, I will definitely emphasize, I sacrificed for at least seven or eight years. Like our one vacation we would take in a year was driving from Fresno, California to Phoenix, Arizona to visit the in-laws for like Thanksgiving or Christmas and then drive back. That's our only vacation we'd ever took because I knew if I spent a dollar outside of that, that would go towards a vacation or something else, that's one less dollar I have to buy another property. And that's less time or it's going to take me longer to quit my job. So I sacrificed everything, got to where I was. Now I will never have a job again. I love it. You talked a lot in the word I keep hearing that kind of underlying all these things is freedom. You, know, you have the freedom to do these things. You have the freedom to pick and choose how you spend your time, how you spend your money. And uh, six weeks, I don't know how much PTO that takes or how many years you'd have to stock that up, but it would be quite a while before you'd be able to do that, especially in a government gig. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Justin, we play a little game on the show called Rapid Fire. Rapid Fire is brought to you by Podigy. If you're a podcaster or aspiring podcaster and you do not want to do your own audio editing, trust me guys, you don't want to try it, uh, or even write your own show notes, do what I do and contact the guys at Podigy. That's what makes me and my guests sound so good every single week. And I cannot tell you how easy it is for me. All right, Justin, are you ready to play Rapid Fire? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. What do you think about when you're alone in your car? When I'm alone in my car, usually I'm thinking about one of two things. I'm usually listening to the audio book of the Bible, the audio Bible, um, that, or I'm thinking about my business, how to make it bigger. One of those two things. You had one not all that long ago. What's your advice for your previous boss? <laughs> 
uh, since it was a government boss, they ha- they were so inefficient at everything. I would say my advice, um, since I know him fairly well, I would say get out of that job. You just you shouldn't be working there. It's a horrible job working any place that's going to be taking your life. What do you want to be when you grow up? I would say somebody that loves my wife, loves my kids, and loves my God. What inspires you? The people that I strive to be like, all the other people in real estate that I've seen what they're doing, everybody with podcasting, with like with my podcast, trying to make it better. It's the other people that I'm looking at them like, wow, I'd like to be where they are. What is your biggest fear? I don't really have any fears. Who do you admire the most? It started with Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki, he wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Fantastic book, really got me started on, on passive income. But when I saw that he was able to quit his job because of that, I said, I got to do that. So definitely Robert Kiyosaki. Which celebrity annoys you the most? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think Hollywood annoys me a lot in general. So I'm just going to stick with that. How do you define success? Success for me is providing for my family and making sure that they're taken care of. Outside of that, it's really whatever goals I make for myself and attain them. Last one, you get to share a drink or a meal with anyone in history, dead or alive. Who is it and why? Oh, easy. Jesus Christ. That's that's the easy one for me. Dustin, you survived rapid fire. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. And those were some fun questions. <laughs> they really were. I didn't say it was easy. You got to listen to the show. See, see future <laughs> guests, be warned. Like that, Those are the questions. If you listen to the show, then you know them. If not, then ah, all bets are off. All right, Dustin, knowing what you know today about your real estate business and all the things that you've been through, all the lessons you've learned, if you were to go back and start over right now, tomorrow, what would you do differently? I absolutely think that's one of the best questions um, that I usually get asked because when I look back at what all the, all the mistakes that I've made, I will be honest, I've lost literally tens of thousands of dollars doing this business the wrong way. And I would, I can give you many examples of how I've done that. But the one thing I would go back and tell myself is get some education that's coaching, like actually have somebody walk you through the process. Somebody that's been there before. Cause you know, when I look at when my younger self, I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't start with a lot of money. And so if I were going to pay somebody, you know, some money to coach me through the process, I'm thinking, man, that's a lot of money. You know, I'm, how am I going to pay that? Or I don't have the money to make that or to pay that. But I'm looking back now. And realizing I've lost tens of thousands of dollars because I didn't know what I was doing. And somebody coaching me would have been able to help me jump past those hurdles and not lose that money. Like give you one really, really quick example. I had one student who was looking at buying a property. For some reason, it had to be vacant for a year. And I told him that, and he said he wants to go with it. It's going to be vacant for a year and no big deal. It's, I, can, I can afford it. And I said, well, here's one thing that you might want to take advantage of or take a look at. If it's vacant for an entire year, then it's going to be not insurable because if you have a property that's not occupied, more than likely a year is a long time. It might get burned down, get stolen or, you know, uh, uh, vandalized or whatever. Your insurance is not going to cover that. And he's like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that it needed to be occupied. And yeah, that's, that's only because I've been there. I've done that. So I've gone through the mistakes. So get coaching is something that I would absolutely say back to my former self. Hey, get coaching. It would save you thousands and thousands of dollars. I love that. And before I let you go, where can my listeners go to connect with you more closely online and learn about how to create passive income through real estate investing? Yeah, thanks, Nick. So I have two different things. Masterpassiveincome.com is my my website you can go to. And I actually have a free course if you're interested in that, a free real estate investing course. So masterpassiveincome.com forward slash free course. Really just simple to put that in there. As well as I have a podcast as well where I talk only about real estate rental properties. It gets kind of kind of boring, but I try to make it exciting because I get excited about what rental properties do with my life because you know rental properties can get boring. But because of what it affords me to do in my life, to travel the world and do whatever I want, it's exciting. And there's a lot of details that go into real estate, goes into all that, especially on the residential side. There's a lot of regulations, a lot of things to be aware of. So I wouldn't use the word boring. I would use the word detailed and, uh, and specific so that you can be set up for success. Dustin, I appreciate you being here, uh, sharing all your expertise with us and, and sacrificing some of your time today. I know you probably have some properties to go buy, so I'll let you run and go do that. But I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Nick. I really appreciate it. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dustin Heiner. Listen, whether it's real estate or not, there's a lot of lessons to be taken from Dustin's experience. One of them is passive income. If you can create a business that provides passive income, even if it's $350, that might not sound like a ton of money. And if you're trying to quit your job and and support a family, that's probably not going to be enough. But that is a car payment. That is health insurance. That is 
extra money you can save. That's money to, to pay down debt. That's significant. Every single one of those little $350 chunks increase. And the beauty of the real estate business, of course, is that once you pay off that principal balance on the property, you're just cash flowing the entire rental payment. And if you want to flip the building, it's worth more because it has a property. It has a tenant in it. And obviously that asset is worth a lot also. So even if you're not in real estate, think about passive income. Does it fit into your business in any way, shape or form? How might you create a business? And I love the analogy he used where he built a business around that idea. And he built systems to basically build his own inventory and create the life that he wants. He chose real estate. You might choose something else, but at the end of the day, that's what a lifestyle business is, freeing you up to, to be able to do things like drive around Japan and travel Europe with your family and not have your income suffer at all. That's the goal. That's the dream. And I think Dustin did a really good job highlighting how he's done that through real estate. If you enjoyed the episode, please do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review it on iTunes or whichever app it is that you're listening to right now, wherever you listen to your podcasts, uh, just hit me with the review. I read each and every one. You're talking directly to me. I want to hear not just what you think about the show in general, but specific episodes. All right, that's it for me. I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you to get in the game if you're not already. Trading time for money is no way to live. You deserve a life on your terms. And building a lifestyle business is the fastest, safest, and best way to do just that. I appreciate y'all being here, and I will talk to you very soon. Thanks for listening to the Building a Lifestyle Business Podcast. To access the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.nickmurphy.io 